Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. If you're watching the video, you'll see I'm sitting in the same chair and wearing the same clothes as last time. And that's because I'm here at Westminster Seminary, California, again, continuing on with a kind of an interview series of different members of the faculty. We previously spoke with uh, Dr. David Van Drunen. There might have been an episode in there, a Voss group, that got placed in between that one and this one. Nevertheless, you'll understand what I'm, what I'm talking about, but... Um, very delighted and excited to be back here today to speak uh, with an older friend, uh, old in terms of time. And I don't mean to accentuate your age. <laughs> That's still out there. Uh, you're not that old. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older, so the percentage of difference keeps decreasing <laughs> over the years. By perception. Uh, Dr. Craig Troxell, uh, who is a professor of practical theology now here at Westminster Seminary, California. Previously was pastor of Bethel OPC in Wheaton. Previously was pastor of Calvary OPC in Glenside, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Craig. It's good to see you. Thank you, Camden. I love uh, catching up with you. I just chase you around the world. Yeah. <laughs> That's my life. It's good to see you. Yeah. Well, you know, I came to, I've, I've rehearsed this story before, but if, in case people don't know, but I, uh, I moved to Philadelphia to attend Westminster Seminary. And uh, Craig was the pastor there for the first about two or three weeks. Uh, and then he moved to Illinois, from which, from whence I came. Right. So exactly. I left Illinois. He left Pennsylvania to get away from me. And um, I attended your going away picnic. My wife and I were very uh, oh. nervous about going to that because we felt like we just showed up and then we ended up going to this church party, but everyone was saying goodbye to you and we don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you weren't crying. <laughs> It's true. You seem giddy. Yeah, we're like, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, and uh, that's where I met Daryl, of all people, yeah. Daryl Hart, and uh, and many others. So we have a lot of dear friends there that you now have since moved away, too. But mm. um, Calvary is a very special place. Our, our mutual friend, Mark Vanderhart, calls it Our Lady of Glenside. <laughs> <laughs> i never heard that. Uh, oh, and funny. the pastor there now, of course, uh, Mark Slade. But then uh, Craig was kind enough to, to have me, and, and the church was kind enough to host me as a year-long intern. I spent eight months there. I didn't do the whole year because I was called to, to Hope uh, in Grays Lake, which are, where I still serve, though in a, a different capacity now as evangelist um, with our, our other friend, Adam York, serving now as the pastor. Mm. But just most recently, Craig uh, moved out here uh, to take up this position as professor of, of practical theology. Um, your predecessor, Dennis Johnson, correct? He retired in many, many years of faithful service, and we had interviewed him a couple times in the program. I always love speaking with him, but uh, tell us a bit about the transition. Now, <laughs> not from him to you, but in terms of your yeah. transition as a person um, now shifting gears. And you've always been teaching in a variety of capacities, right. either as adjunct faculty or through MTI or being a, a a mentor with many, many interns over the years. Yeah. So you've been doing this work <clears throat> to some degree, but now it's it's different. You have it a is different, different nine to five. Yeah, know? I think that's I think that's important to say. It's um, I've always enjoyed teaching. I came to I can truly say I came to love teaching Sunday school in my my congregation more than anything else. But and enjoyed being an adjunct and the opportunities Westminster Philadelphia Mid America gave. But yeah, this is very different. It's different cadence. You know, Sunday, everything used to gear up for Sunday, and now Sunday's a little bit of a letdown. And, um, but the transition has been helped by the people that we've met and known here, or getting to know here. Um, the, the faculty, staff are, are amazing here at the school, and the students have really been wonderful too. Um, I had probably not anticipated, you know, how much time you spend with students and how much I have enjoyed that. And just listening to them and the way that, Literally, students are coming from all over the world from different callings and hearing how God has called them to the ministry or how they're trying to sort that out, mm -hmm. um, and how that's changed over the years. So now most of them are married, families, um, or second career. So uh, that has been good. I've been, I, I still feel the challenge of what I'm doing. I, I really do feel like I'm taking up a new apprenticeship, mm -hmm. starting at the bottom again, just even learning how to craft a good lecture. I... I really appreciate now the work that my mentors did and and seeing what's acceptable and what's not. And so I'm I'm really um, I'm pedaling very fast <laughs> for an old guy. Yeah, but I'm I'm enjoying the challenge and and I love the things I'm talking about and thinking about and I'm glad for the opportunity to to think carefully about preaching. 
uh, about its methodology, what it is, and, and the pastoral ministry too, and to have some time to just slow down and reflect upon the pastoral ministry. Um, and I can already see the ways in which that has affected the way I've, I've taught some things or things I took for granted and had to kind of work it, spin it out more. Uh, so that's, that's really been enjoyable. Mm. Um, but yeah, the people have, have made it easier. But moving to California, is it, this is a different culture here. And some parts of it I've really come to enjoy already. Uh, the relaxed atmosphere of people, you know, where apologize to somebody says, hey, no problem. You know, was, that's not usually the response I got in Philadelphia, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was a delight to have, be in a different climate and uh, different weather and for our children to visit us and, and really enjoy this. And so, yeah, lots of new things, mm. lots of new things. Tell us a bit about, uh, you know, as you're learning and, and, and using your words and, and coming up to speed in this new apprenticeship for you is learning how to be a professor of practical theology. Certainly, you, you're devoting time and, and attention not only to learn the, the core values of the seminary here, but also those that are specific to the department. Mm -hmm. So tell, tell us a bit about some of the distinctives or at least the goals and objectives of practical theology here at Westminster Seminary, California, and what are you trying to uh, inculcate in the students and, and help them in their spiritual formation? Hmm. Well, I think one of the, the, one of the pillars here would be uh, concern truly to preach the gospel. And so that foundation has been laid uh, so wonderfully by Dennis Johnson and Julius Kim and, and before them, uh, Ed Clowney, Howell Jones, um, and and you know the reputations of these men are well deserved. I mean, Dennis Johnson's book "Can We Proclaim" is is so significant, especially in thinking about the methodology of how we preach Christ. And so, being able to build upon that really fine work of others, to to assume that, um, is very comforting and helpful. And there's a lot there. There are not many seminaries around the world where you could do that. That you could feel like, okay, we got this in the house. This is locked, locked in, you know. And um, now, I to fill Dennis Johnson's shoes, uh, which is an impossible task, is it's not going to happen. Um, but I've I've appreciated just I've met him a little bit and chatting with him. Uh, he's already been such an encouragement, and Julius Kim, who's just wonderful um, about this, just really encouraged me to you know stick to my own stuff, as it were, and. Bring what you bring, uh, which is not considerable, <laughs> especially considering the people we're talking about. So I think that's that's one of the distinctives. The other other distinctive too is a, a real concern to develop pastors, uh, not preachers, not celebrity preachers, but pastors who really, really understand that they must spend themselves for the sake of the flock. And I don't pretend to be an expert in that, mm -hmm. as a man who had to daily fight his own selfishness mm -hmm. and sense of self importance. All these demons, if we could put it that way, that we struggled against. But a real concerted effort to help uh, the, the men and women we train to understand what does it mean to uh, minister to people in a way where you're self-conscious about taking up your cross. Mm -hmm. And that in your identity, your very identity, is that I am a steward of that which ultimately does not belong to me, mm -hmm. but belongs to the king. And then I think um, also uh, a profound self-consciousness of being one who suffers, that part of me is to take up um, suffering in my identity with Christ and as a servant. And so these are things that are important. And I think, I think last, last of all would be uh, a concern for uh, personal holiness. If I could say piety, without, a, without shame, we should use that word, piety. And so... How do we encourage our students to pursue godliness? And, and that has been actively encouraged by my colleagues, that we're very concerned about these students as people. Mm -hmm. And that and we are speaking to some prospective students, and I said, one of the things we'll be concerned about here is you. Who are you becoming? Mm -hmm. And very, very concerned to, to gently encourage you along the path of holiness while you're here mm -hmm. and to establish good habits of personal discipleship. Those are, those are really, really, really great things. And the whole while, pushing them, saying, look, we want you to develop yourself in your mind, intellectually, mm -hmm. uh, but all the way around, to be a, a better family man, as it were, to be a good parent, to be a good spouse, 
um, the whole thing, because this is this this all comes in to an effective ministry, as as Paul says to Timothy. Tell me a bit about your uh, experience with with the churches nearby. Now there are, are many churches. Uh, of course, you and I are ministers in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, but Westminster Seminary, California, in many of the same ways as Mid America Reformed Seminary, has a has a more ecumenical atmosphere, and. Um, the, the faculty are, if I'm not mistaken, are called to subscribe to both sets of standards, the Westminster standards, as well as the three forms of unity. Um, and I'm a board member out at Mid-America, and you and I have both taught there. But that adds a different um, character, and I think it's utterly critical that um, if a seminary is desirous of being a servant of the church, and a, particularly in the practical theology department, seeking to assist in spiritual formation and allow for the students to grow and flourish within ecclesiastical contexts, it is imperative that the, all the professors, but especially uh, the practical theology professors, would have healthy relationships with all of these churches. Um, how's, how's your time been, your first semester, in terms of visiting different churches and establishing relationships? Have you found a, a strong uh, kind of bilateral uh, relationship between the seminary and these and these churches? Yeah, very much. Mm. Uh, the very first church I preached in here was New Life Presbyterian Church, the PCA in Escondido. Mm. And the hospitality that I received there was just really encouraging and wonderful and warm. I met Tingling Lee's father, mm. who's an elder there. Um, but but it, that came simultaneously with invitations, not just from sister Orthodox Presbyterian Church congregations to preach. And I've preached about five or six of those churches in our presbytery, uh, but local uh, United Reformed Church right. pastors who said, hey, we'd like to have you preach sometime. Can we get together? Meeting a guest preachers who come to chapel as well, locally Grace Bible Church here in, in town, um, other congregations. And th- that's been really, really good. And you're right. It's very important to appreciate these local ministries uh, beyond the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. So that has been wonderful. I mean, most of our students that come here are not coming from your traditional Reformed denominations. Mm-hmm. They're coming from all over the place. Mm-hmm. And so even looking beyond uh, the, the confines, if I could put it that way, of local denominations that represented in churches, it's also important to be aware of what other ministries are taking place. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's been uh, wonderful opportunities to meet other people, and I've, I've really appreciated that. So I guess we could speak of the friendly confines of Wrigley Field and the confessional confines of the Orthodox Presbyterian <laughs> Church. It works for me. <laughs> I love it. Craig has written a book entitled, uh, With All Your Heart, Orienting Your Mind, Desires, and Will Toward Christ. It's published with Crossway. Uh, just came out. I actually don't, I, I mean, I saw a bunch of copies here. I had a PDF copy. I'm not absolutely certain it's it's published, uh, or at least people can buy it on Amazon, but I presume they will by the time this airs. So it's brand new. But this has been something that you've been working on for a while, and uh, and the ideas of which have been kind of uh, marinating. Mm-hmm. Tell, tell us about the origins of those books. I know a little more from the inside, but yeah. uh, how did this project come about? Oh, I think it's a confluence of a lot of things. Uh, probably uh, from reading John Owen originally, mm. and maybe even before that, reading a popularizer, uh, Chris Lungard, The Enemy Within. Yeah, where he, it's a great he, book. He presents the grid that Owen is using, and then reading an Owen, and then seeing this pop up with other you know, Puritans. Um, but I think it was, I was preaching Psalm 51 at Glenside, in Calvary, OPC and Glenside. So this is over 12 years ago. Um, and seeing the cluster of terms that, are used at the beginning of that that psalm that David uses the three most often used words of in the Old Testament for sin, sin, iniquity, and transgression, and seeing how those lined up really wonderfully with the the three functions of the heart, the mind, the desires, and the will, and seeing how the the terms were really helpful to bring out the, uh, the capacity of our heart to sin in its distinctive ways, intellectually and then affectionately, uh, to use a Puritan's term for desires, and then the will, uh, volitionally. Um, so those things came together. Then I started playing around. Well, I should say, in the background of this was always the threefold office of Christ. That was a part of my dissertation work and has always been an interest of mine. And so seeing that as an overlay of how how is Christ redemptively at work in our hearts, um, I think those things started to converge. And so I put together a Sunday school series that I did at Bethel Church in Wheaton, uh, 
I probably like eight, nine years ago, something like that. And in the church was Al Fisher, who then was an editor. And after the end of the Sunday School series, he said, you should put together a book proposal, which I did. There's more to the story than that, but that's kind of the short version. And and I did, and I offered it in a, a proposal to Crossway. They accepted it. And um, that project even went through some reversion, revisions. Started writing probably about seven years ago. And with my study breaks uh, that I had a couple weeks every year, started trying to get this thing done, mm-hmm. uh, which was a real challenge. But I was, but actually having that time was helpful because I would like do a conference for like an OPC church or a men's retreat, kind of using this grid. And to me, it was kind of like throwing this spaghetti against the refrigerator door to see if it would stick. You know, is it done? Is the pasta ready? And um, and it gave me a sense of, okay, this was not helpful. Don't ever say this again. <laughs> and uh, I remember doing a family conference in Michigan for that presbytery with the original order of uh, that I had the book laid out in and came home absolutely decidedly understanding that, that was the wrong order wow. and wrote the crossway and say, is it possible for us to rewrite the proposal? I've got the wrong order. This is not the way to do it. And what I did originally was that just describing the functions of the heart in the first section, but it meant that all the grace came at the last end of the book. And I thought, that's not right. I don't want that. Mm-hmm. And so doing those conferences and talks were so helpful to really, you know, mull over this material. And so where I feel good about it is uh, not just thinking, but just just really having the opportunity to talk to God's people about this material and putting it in a, in a form where it's, it's really, the sauce has been cooking a long time, you know, and, and so I feel good about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the sense that this was not just a, I didn't slap it together, that's for sure. Um, so it is what it is, but it, it's nice when you can say, I, I've thought about this, you know, I really, I'm very open to correction and areas, things I've left out and, mm-hmm. um, but at least I can say that I've, I've reflected on it. I think it's I think that's a good example of, you know, a more ideal way of developing books, materials, and whatnot to do it within the context of the church. And uh, I've been thinking about that lately. How best to do that? And I think that's a tremendous way when you can write, but then you can teach in various capacities into different groups of people, but you're, you're all doing it within the context of the people of God and understanding what is most edifying and helpful. Sometimes some books that's not really possible in a church right. context right. if it's an academic mm-hmm. title, but there would be an analogy there where you could you know, run things by your colleagues, speak with mm-hmm. people at other institutions, have brothers in your presbytery examine things and push back. But to develop a resource in isolation just sounds tremendously foolish and... and uh, and dangerous, but well, to develop yeah. it this way, you end up producing a much more fruitful product, I think. And 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 hopeful that it will be accessible to people. Yeah. I mean, think about how we call a preacher. I mean, you have to pass your exams, get through presbytery, and the presbytery has to sign off on your on your, on your sermon. But it's not until you're called and those people hear you preach. It's not until that moment when they feel like, yes, this is a man who could feed us. Mm-hmm. We understand him, and he understands us. That's when you get that connection, and that's the proof in the pudding. And I think that's going to be true for any book, you know. Yeah. Well, um, you do speak about the heart. That's the big thing with the book, <laughs> but that that is deceptive. Not the heart's deceptive. I guess the heart is wicked above all things. But that's another question. <laughs> the word, my goodness, yeah. the word has such a semantic range, even in English, but it also does in in Hebrew yeah. and in Greek. How is heart, uh, the word, the idea, frequently understood in our contemporary culture, for example? Let's start there. Feelings. And one word is feelings, emotion. And that's it. And, and first and foremost, the heart in contemporary culture is about what I feel. And, and that's, that's not the way it's used in Scripture. That's part of it. Yeah. But that's not, and maybe that's not the most important part. Yeah. I'm not sure the Puritans would agree with that, actually, but we can get to that. But, but yeah, it's, it's very different from how we conceive of it in our culture. I'm going to read to you your definition. I'm going to read to you a definition that I changed. You tell me what is different from what you wrote. No, I'm kidding. I'm going to play a game. <laughs> is this your writing or not? No. Uh, this is a quote. 
The heart is the governing center of a person, and when used simply, it reflects the unity of our inner being, and when used comprehensively, it describes the complexity of our inner being as composed of mind, what we know, desires, what we love, and will, what we choose. Why is that, that grid or framework helpful for, for giving us more of a biblical understanding of heart rather yeah. than one that's just driven by the culture? Well, I think fundamentally, first of all, to understand every time we see the word heart in Scripture, first to assume it, it's referring to the unity of who we are. In, in that sense, it's almost synonymous with spirit, soul, conscience, inner person, inner man, as Paul says. But I think the, the second part in terms of the uniqueness of the word and where it's different from soul or spirit or conscience is that there's a complexity that, you know, we have to give some credit. Postmodernism has understood that there's a complexity to us within, but this has been the Bible all along. The Puritans really seized upon this and that there are times when you're reading along in scripture and you realize in this particular place, the word heart is, is being used to emphasize one aspect of who we are. In the Old Testament, for instance, despite perhaps perceptions to the contrary, most often it's referring to the mind, to the cognitive part, to the understanding. And that's why you see it pop up so predominantly in the wisdom literature, more than anywhere else in scripture. That would surprise us. We would expect to see brain or something like that somewhere there. Um, but there's other times where it's clear it's talking about what the person wants in their heart, mm -hmm. which is the way we most associate it associate with with heart is that if I can't get what I want I'm going to be upset and that's why we attach feelings and emotions to the heart and rightly so I get what I want I'm very happy I rejoice in that because my desires my affections have have uh, reached what they wanted but there's other times too where it's uh, scripture is describing either the willfulness of the person their stubbornness um, a heart a, a, a hard heart um, or it's describing uh, the weakness of that heart or the fact that that heart is enslaved mm -hmm. to sin. And there it's obviously emphasizing the will, but not at the expense of uh, the mind or the desires. And we would say the same for the other components. And, that's, and that is a very, very important insight that we are never thinking just pure thoughts that are devoid of what the desires want or as if our thinking was devoid of an agenda or motives, or that there's times when um, our will is somehow unattached from, from what we think. Right. So the breadth of the use of the word heart in a, in a you know, fuller dimensional kind of understanding, is, it's, it's helpful. Um, and you write something that's kind of provocative in part one. Well, it's provocative for people who don't understand the biblical understanding very well. But part one is the is knowing, that of knowing. And you write that if the heart principally does one thing, what are we going to say? It feels, you say, it thinks. So why is that really such a surprising statement? You've already kind of alluded to it, but uh, yeah. how, how is that going <clears> to <throat> reorient people right away? Well, it's, it's contrary to what we've been told um, as children of, of uh, Greek philosophy, but it's, it's contrary to our, our culture. And the heart is so wedded to what we think is our most authentic self and what we feel. Um, and, I, and I think even um, present-day evangelical Christians, um, even we are susceptible to that idea. And it runs a little bit contrary to the spirit of the times in the church. And I think it, 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 it suggests, too, that for us, uh, the intellectual component to the faith, thinking, understanding, memorizing, meditating... Um, not so much meditating, but we see those as less spiritual tasks. And that the feeling God in his presence for us represents the zenith of spirituality. Um, and it's contrary to what some voices are saying as well. And, and this is unfortunate because I think it feeds into the anti-intellectualism that we already suffer from in the church, and which is always a great danger. Always. How does how does this knowing or, or and and knowing from the heart um, interface with um, the category the Bible often uses of wisdom? Where do we find the connection there? How is heart used, for example, even in the Book of Proverbs? Yeah, I think well, it's interesting how it begins. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. It means that there's a component to knowing um, that recognizes my humble place before God. That. It's a, it's a knowledge that is willing to be subservient, um, 
to to all of what my heart must uh, absorb with regard to the greatness of God and his sovereignty and his truth, which must guide my life, that I don't guide my own life. That means that there, that submission inherently involves my heart, um, my will, that I am not king of the universe and I must bow and, and, and listen, and it also involves the desires. When you think of in chapters uh, 7, 8, and 9 of, of how this um, placing and contrast the voice of Dame Folly versus Lady Wisdom, and it's calling out to the simple, so you think it's only intellectual, but ultimately it means, do you desire me? Do you desire wisdom or do you desire folly and the pursuit of the flesh? And uh, they both call from that prominent place of the city. They're obviously placed in these parallel tracks. And the simple as it says, some fall into folly, but some fall into wisdom. Well, part of it is, is what do I desire? Mm -hmm. And so my whole heart must be involved. It's interesting how Solomon, in the beginning of his reign, um, had a listening heart, literally is how it's put, you know, as opposed to just, he was smart. You know, he had a listening heart. He was humble. He was willing to listen. But what happened? Mm -hmm. He did exactly what God told the kings not to do, to acquire principally uh, horses, gold, and women. And he, became, he invested himself in all three, and uh, his heart was turned away, principally by the, the false gods of his wives. And it's interesting that when you hear some of the, the, the praise given to like Asa and Hezekiah, um, that they love God with all their heart. But it's interesting that David tells Solomon, make sure that you uh, pursue God's commands with a whole heart. And you almost get the sense that he knew something about his son. And his son even prays that in 1 Kings 8 at his inauguration, giving all these things that, that we would have serve you with our whole heart. And then you come to uh, 1 Kings that says that this just ended badly for him. And it says because he did not serve God with a whole heart. It doesn't say all the hearts, it says a whole heart. Mm -hmm. Shalem. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because that that's it comes from the same wording as shalom for peace, which means it's comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And so what it, I think what it's connoting is that his whole heart that he under, had understanding, but he had not submitted himself, and ultimately his desires were not for God. Mm. Yeah, it was you know insightful to me to be reminded of the fact also that when the bio, when Proverbs especially is speaking, you say it's a rule of thumb even in the book of Proverbs that when you encounter the phrase lacks sense or has no sense or void of understanding, wanteth no understanding, lacks understanding, lacks sense, really it's a translation of the literal phrase lacks heart. <laughs> that I think that helps people say, "Oh, that's that's how the Bible's using this." I, it's it's really something else, and it is such a broader range of understanding than just pure intellectualism or pure emotionalism. Yeah. It's a full formed notion of the inner man, really, mm -hmm. in many ways. Yeah. Lev Lev um, Describe to me. Um, the role of Christ's prophetic ministry in all this. You know, you talked a bit about, you You know, some of this is, is developing out of your study of the threefold office of Christ, uh, the monist triplex, um, and you've obviously developed that in many ways in terms of ecclesiology, which has been helpful. Uh, but now um, we need to think of Christ, you know, as Lord over all, but he's Lord of our hearts he's, he, and whatnot. But what does his prophetic ministry specifically have to do here? Something that you develop in terms of this knowing aspect of things? Yeah, and I think it's, you know, I, perhaps for many of us, um, especially if we're not raised in the doctrines of grace, we think of uh, the person who has direct access to our heart is maybe a preacher, you know. And Scripture is very concerned to tell us that Christ in his prophetic ministry um, is not, as it were, um, subcontracting out all of his work, that he does use indirect instruments like ministers, but he is actively involved and by his word and spirit, we would say. Hmm. And so that when Christ says, I'm not abandoning you, I'm sending you to spirit, and he will remind you of the things I've taught you. And everything he teaches is what is what I teach. It's the same. And so we have that ministry of Christ in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And, and here is where he is at work as he, as the Holy Spirit joins together the truth of God's word, and especially in very pointed and sometimes very painful ways, is illuminating to ourselves. Here's where the rub of the Lordship of Christ is right now in your life. Here is where you are expressing pride. Here is where your anger lies. 
And this is, this is a very, very helpful ministry. It's not a vague ministry. We're not left guessing what we really need to be working on. It's very poignant. And so we have this, thus saith the Lord, going on in our hearts mm-hmm. as that Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, as the New Testament calls him, um, is, is, is showing us what we need to work on. The, the wonderful thing, too, about a Christian, about having a new heart, God said this through Ezekiel. I'm going to, you'll have my statutes on your heart. That he he has so opened our eyes to the saving knowledge of Christ. He's opened up his truth to us. That that we know, we we really know what we have to do. It's not as if, in terms of our most direct duties, we don't have an understanding. We do, mm-hmm. through Scripture, and um, it's wonderful to know too that he's he constantly is renewing our minds, as as Romans twelve one and two says, and. And I think this is something really important to say in our postmodern day. He's giving us a strong sense of assurance. The postmodern voice would say, you know, we really can't be certain about what about truth. And there's certainly no absolutes. And, and deconstructionism, too, has, has kind of dismantled anybody's confidence that anything I, I read has any objective un, you know, truth to it whatsoever. Mm. But Christ is very concerned that we know. And it's interesting how, like, when John writes in 1 John 5, 13, we write these things so that you may know. Mm-hmm. And this ministry has been so powerful that we look at our predecessors, especially in the early church. They had such assurance of truth that they would go to the stake, literally, for what they knew. And that's a level of confidence that postmodernism is not comfortable with. and says, we cannot have, we should not have. And Christ has told us, yes. You do need to have this because I need to know that you will follow me unto death. Mm-hmm. And in Revelation 12, you have this beautiful statement of these, of these martyrs who did not love themselves unto death uh, because of this strong sense that this faith you know, that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ is, is greater than all of the knowledge. And, and this is what's taking place in our hearts. And, and that's part of that prophetic ministry of Christ, mm-hmm. that constant assurance and they have these, these wonderful means of grace, like the Lord's Supper, you know, this consistent, frequent reminder of to bring us back to the very center of the gospel, as, as Voss says. It, the, the Supper brings you to the core, brings you back to the most simple things of what you know is true. And this is a wonderful, wonderful gift that Christ has given to us in, in word and sacrament. Mm. You know, moving from love, unknowing uh, to part two, you start to speak about the heart and its role in terms of loving or what our desires are. And um, the desires of the heart are, are, are significant. Uh, you say, um, it is from within, out of our heart, that evil desires, like coveting, deceit, envy, and pride arise, as do righteous desires, like seeking God, his kingdom, and his righteousness, and loving one another. How do, how do these desires of the heart help, understanding them, help help? Not only for us to understand ourselves and our and our plight within this world, but then also help us to understand to be more faithful to the Lord. Hmm. Well, I think it's to understand that both in the Old Testament, and New Testament, the the vocabulary we have for desires is is not uh, vocabulary where it is intrinsically suggesting good or bad. In other words, the words that were given, you have to see them in context to see whether it's referring to something good or bad. And so the the commandment, "Thou shalt not covet." is actually the word for desire. Mm. But, you know, earlier command, it gives us the context for what I should desire, namely not my neighbor's wife Mm -hmm. or his donkey or his house. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one person, I think it was John Freeman, puts it very helpfully. um, I cannot desire things that are either uh, out of bounds or out of balance. And so those are good. It's a good, simple way of understanding that the desires I have are not necessarily good or bad. And a lot of Christians are raised in a tradition that says, if you have a very strong desire, then it surely is sinful. Mm-hmm. That God does not want you to be happy, that happy. Now, that would be inconceivable <laughs> to like something in the world this much that you could be happy. And the Bible is saying, no, that's not true. But the world would tell us uh, that any unrequited uh, desire would be bad. Any unfulfilled desire, that is bad. Right. Probably, probably the message of the movie Titanic, you know, <laughs> that pursue it contramundum, you know, no matter what society or your parents or honor or decency tells you, pursue love because you're pursuing your heart. And the Bible saying, no, neither one is true, that God has made us in such a way that we are to pursue our desires, but for the right things and in the right way. Working is a, is a good desire. 
Can I desire work too much that does damage my life? As a pastor, I can tell you, yes. <laughs> For myself, and I've seen it in others, where it just takes over and it becomes what? Mm -hmm. An idol. Mm -hmm. And this is a really, really helpful category in Scripture, what I call in the book at one point, uber desires. When desires have now, they've, they've, they're out of control. And that's why you see, I think this is very interesting, this language of idols, the vocabulary drop off in the New Testament. Idolatry is there and idols is there. But the frequency drops off tremendously. And what picks up is this language of desires. Because that's what idols and idolatry are about all along. Mm -hmm. Not what that little figurine or whatever, but what, what it represented, what I wanted, and what I can't have, what I should not have. But I'm going to pursue it anyway. Yeah, That's an idol. So, I mean, to put it another way, um, God has created us with desires. The desires are not in and of themselves wrong. But again, it, can, it requires the context to understand what we desire and in what way and for what reason. I mean, uh, what was Augustine's uh, famous statement? Of course, speaking of our hearts, and uh, they're not fulfilled until, you know, we find the Lord. But we're, you know, we're not machines, but you get my drift. We're right. desire machines. I mean, we produce desires, but they need right. to be directed toward the Lord. We're made in his image, and he, he is our fulfillment. And what our ultimate desire is, is to see him and worship him face to face in, in the highest heavens. <laughs> but those desires get misdirected and sin redirects us in, in terrible ways. Um, and not to know that um, is even worse because then we get all sorts of deceived. So God did create us to desire, but it's when we twist our desires toward inappropriate ends, you write, or in disproportionate levels that things go wrong. I like that balance, or out of bounds or out of balance. It's, it's I think color. it's a great quote. I'm pretty sure it's John Freeman in his book, mm -hmm. Hide or Seek, but um, I think Psalm 73 has just got to be the pinnacle statement of this, mm -hmm. you know, that my foot almost slipped, you know, because I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And then the psalmist has that change that comes about after worshiping in the sanctuary of God in verse 25, he, he really comes to himself that there's nothing on earth that I have that I desire besides you. And where he and I think this is where the Puritans were helpful. I mean, they really did understand that, like in preaching, if I'm not getting to this level in my preaching, if I'm not getting at this, then what am I doing? And I think that's why especially those that understand the doctrines of grace in our preaching, we understand this is, this is where a lot of the action is taking place. John Owen said this is almost always where Satan begins his attack, is here. He said this is, this is, where he, this is how he came to Eve, mm -hmm. appealing to her desires. Now, I think it involved the mind as well. But I think there's something helpful there. And so that those that want to say this is all the heart is, is desires. You understand what they're trying to say mm -hmm. and why I can't fault them. And I would say, well, you are a third correct. You know, um, but I do think in the terms of the Christian life, if I'm not asking myself questions on this level, then I'm not really getting at where I, I really need to, to be at work. Because there's a lot of times that our motives, you know, our desires are at work, like in our very first anniversary when I gave my wife a skill saw, you know, <laughs> you could... You could say, well, wait, who was the gift for? Not quite a you know? bowling ball with your name exactly, on it. Exactly. Not exactly that. But and I'm kind of joking. But but we do that all the time. Yeah. It's like, it's. I mean, that's an obvious one. Yeah. But there are less obvious ones where, just think about it for a second. You know, why do you want this so bad? Or like, you know, dealing with somebody, I remember once a situation, one of our children was just really, really angry. And I, and I said, what did you do? And just exploded in tears. Because there was a desire underneath there expressing itself in this emotive way, and it was really helpful. But you, in terms of this study, I mean, it, it's been very, very helpful for asking myself questions and to my own regret. But as a pastor, it's been very helpful to ask better questions. And I've never been good at asking questions. Uh, I'm not an interviewer. But, uh, but as a pastor... Um, thinking about where, where would this passage go? But see, I think as an individual Christian reading my Bible, why am I invested in this decision? Or as I talk about this with, with my spouse, why are we both so emotional about this? Why am I so invested? Well, now you're getting, now we're getting somewhere. And I think that's uh, true for all of us. We need to ask ourselves questions on this level. Just as long as we understand that, look, your, your will is involved in this and your mind, and this is affecting your thinking and 
And, and here again, we have, have, we have to thank God for his truth that is so helpful and help me sort out my, the mixture of my motives, help me to sort out what's lesser and greater. As a professor in college once said, we, we have to say no to the good things we can say yes to the better things. Mm. That there can yeah. be things in my life that are surely very noble and good, but, yeah. but wait, that's getting in the way of what's more important. I think that's been the lesson of my 30s. <laughs> To learn that the thing, what ends up happening, maybe not in everyone's life, but at least in my life, life becomes more of a, you have to start making decisions, not between what is good and what is bad. I mean, obviously right. there's that, that struggle of sin. That's not what sure. I'm talking about, but exactly. in terms of opportunities or decisions you might make, you have to start making decisions between what is, what is good and what's better. And yeah. then even between what's better and what's best. Yes. Right. Exactly. That's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Let me ask you, um, you know, speaking along pastoral lines and counseling lines, we have obviously two other parts to speak of in terms of the the heart and choosing and keeping. We'll get there, but at least between knowing and loving and our desires and our knowledge, um, there there's something that that is so important when we start to understand pastoral counseling, for example. How do we prevent ourselves from from examining the heart and these different aspects of the heart and then looking at them kind of like a mechanic might look at an engine in a car and say we got some diagnostic problems you've got issues in the counseling room (laughs) okay um i think what you need is a dose we're just going to change your desires so we want you now to love this thing instead of that thing or you look at it and you're like well you what your problem is you just don't know this so if i give you these facts that'll fix you yeah well, I wish it were like that. It reminds me of the Bob Newhart episode where the prison stop comes in. Then. Stop. Just stop. You know, it's like, oh, I wish it was that easy. I mean, I think this is kind of what C.S. Lewis is getting at, that, you know, God's like a dentist. You know, you don't come in, you get a pill. Now he takes out the drill. And the problem is with our hearts, it goes so deep for us that it takes a lifetime for change. And to truly desire Christ first and foremost and the things of Christ first and foremost, it, it takes years. You know, it's, it's a long obedience, as Eugene Peterson says, rightly so. And, and so I think in, in this particular area we're talking of, we need such patience. And I think it means we need patience uh, with our church members as pastors. And Paul says that, be patient with everyone, after he lists three different categories of people. So, but, but remember, be patient with everyone. I think a spouses especially be patient, and it means this is going to take some time. Uh, one way to think of it is that you know a fully loaded eighteen wheeler. Let's say it has caterpillar like equipment that. on the back of it. I thought you might like that, <laughs> and it's going you know seventy miles per hour down the interstate in Nebraska. And okay, I'll give you Nebraska there, for this illustration. My, my one time, <laughs> or seventy five. I think it's the speed limit there, and you need to stop. Yeah. And. It's not going to stop right away. It's probably at least a quarter of a mile would be my guess for it to finally stop. And a lot of Christians don't appreciate that even after conversion, they've had this sin in their life. And it's like that semi-truck. It's been going that way for 15, 20 years. And now we need to stop it. In fact, we need to turn it around. And it's going to take time. That means that it takes time for forgiveness. It takes time for real change. And that, and that initial change is so... It's the, it, the incremental change is so minutia sometimes. It's so tiny. And, you know, Calvin says at one point in the Golden Book of the Christian Life, it's, some, it's, it's book three of the Institutes, chapter six or ten somewhere, but he says, sometimes it feels like we're just on our hands and knees crawling. And he says, but let's thank God we're making progress. <laughs> you know, and that's a very realistic picture. And so I think the desires of the heart are especially a tough area where we can feel frustrated for other people that are really, really trying to break a, a lifelong habit or something that they have just loved. And that's what we forget about the desires. I mean, we're talking about what we love. And it's hard to pass up on things that we have, we have loved or, th- or things that we thought we loved. Mm. So it's going to take time. And this is where the Holy Spirit uh, is at work in Philippians 2, 12, and 13. is is very helpful here that as we work out our salvation with fear of trembling, that he is at work, and it says both, to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Mm-hmm. Not just to do the right things, to will, mm-hmm. to, to want them. And that word there, will, is, it's, you go back and forth. Does it mean desire? Does it mean will? 
Well, speak more about that, about the choosing aspect of, of the heart. The choosing of the heart, the will of the heart, and this is, this is so interesting that our Reformed forefathers understood this is where the action is. That we, if we're going to talk about real reformation, we need to talk about the will and the state of the will. And so this is why Jonathan Edwards and Luther and Calvin, before them Augustine, understood this battle was extremely important. And the will reflects a twofold capacity. That on the one hand, no matter whether we're regenerate or unregenerate, whether we are a born again Christian or not, there are things that we strongly resist. There are things that uh, we cave to. Mm-hmm. And so the unbeliever is highly resistant towards God, mm-hmm. that they would rather die than switch. You know, they'd rather dig in their heels and resist anything and everything from God. It's interesting, but reading the book of Revelation, the things that happen, and it says, and yet they would not repent. That is, that is that willful heart that is stubborn. And yet, that very same person, there are certain temptations in their life, they cave in a heartbeat. In fact, they're slaves. Their, their will is enslaved to it. Well, when a person becomes a Christian, that switches. Mm-hmm. And so now here is a person who's able to actually resist sin, not always, and not always to the same degree, but is in the fight and is really, really trying to suppress their flesh, is trying to resist Satan, and not just knows, but truly desires that I don't want this. A part of me does, but, but I don't. And yet when it comes to the leading of the Spirit, when it comes to seeing things in Scripture, this is a person whose heart has now suddenly become tender and submissive and strongly desires to serve Christ and has submitted. And I think that's very helpful to see because I think for those of us who have raised children, we think having stubborn children is bad. And yes, it's hard. <laughs> raising stubborn children. Um, I'm speaking theoretically, not for my children, <laughs> obviously. But it's hard, and you think this is terrible. But, but think about the world in which we're raising these kids. What do we need? We need, we need Martin Luther's. We need children who will turn their, their back to the world and say, I'm following Christ, and not looking over the shoulder to see who's following them. And so that strong will can be a real blessing when God transforms it and uses it for himself. And on the other hand, to be mindful of the fact that in some of these most stubborn people, you see incredible gentleness mm-hmm. and tenderness towards, towards God and to the needs of a brother and sister in Christ. And so here again, I think there's just tremendous hope when God takes, as he says he will, with every believer, I will remove from you that heart of stone mm-hmm. and give you a heart of flesh, something that's alive. Circumcised. Yeah, that's really, it's beautiful. And it's, it's a great promise to, to us because we find ourselves many times not just with McModus, but with a will that it's not as strong as it should be or it's not as submissive as it should be. Yeah. Perhaps that's a great danger. One of the greatest dangers of, uh, for the Christian in his or her mm-hmm. life is apathy. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it's, it's one thing to know what is right. Richard Sibbs talks about this in the Bruce Reed. It was my very first Puritan book I ever read and it's still one of my top 10 favorites. But he said, it's not enough to know what is right, but will it be strong? And I've forgotten the quote, but it's in the book. Um, and I, it reminds me of living in Alaska where, you know, every Alaskan knows what you're supposed to do when you meet a grizzly bear, when, especially if it's running after you. But that's not the issue of your knowledge. <laughs> Are you committed? Where's your will? Are you willing to go fetal, curl up and ball? And, or are you going to run away? Which, is, of course, is the instinct. But it, it's an issue of, am I, am I, is my will in it? So it's never a matter of beliefs. For the it's a matter of conviction, has it? Or as Lendl Smith, our mutual friend, mm-hmm. would say, my predecessor and dear brother, would say, "Do we believe what we believe? If we yeah. would only believe what we believe." And that, and that's where the will comes in, where it's now it's in my bones, it's my marrow, and I'm fully committed. And that can't happen without the will, and, and God knows that, and that's why I think our Reformed forefathers really understood the importance of the will of the heart. So in the fourth part, um, you speak about keeping. So we just to review, knowing, loving, choosing, now keeping. You speak about keeping your heart, the gatekeepers of the heart, ambassador of your heart. That's pretty interesting. Mm. And then the keeper of mm. the heart. How does this round out the book and, and provide even further color and context for what you're getting at? Well, I think it's, it's, it's an attempt to say that not that the book's not been practical to that point, but it's trying to be further, even more practical to say, yeah. how, do, how do we do this? How do we keep our heart? Mm-hmm. And of course, that is what Proverbs 4.23 tells us we have to do, because from the heart issues uh, flow all the issues of life. This is, if this really is the center, we should be watching it. But we're not always so good in that. 
Yeah. And so how does scripture help us in this? And what it tells us is a good barometer where we are is the ambassador of the heart, you know, the mouth. And this is this comes out of the teachings of Christ, you know, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And that's why he said, it's almost hilarious, he says, it's not what you put in your mouth, it's what's come out of your mouth. And, you know, the stuff that goes in your mouth, that's eventually going to get expelled. I mean, he's, he's, he's pretty, I think he's being pretty graphic, actually. But the stuff that comes out, that suggests what's in there and rotting away, the stuff that has not been expelled. And, and we get insight into that. It, I think it's Jay Dalman in his book on the Ten Commandments who says that what's going on in the heart is like an executive session of a, of a board meeting, you know? <laughs> it's all supposed to stay in there. Whatever happened, it's not supposed to get out. But it gets out. And that's what happens is that it, it just leaks out when we, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Oh, yeah, you did. It was in there. It was in there. And so that's, so that's, a, that's in a good barometer. And it's nice to have friends who look and say, do you know what you just said? And sometimes we're just oblivious that we're always telling more than we mean to tell. This is all pastors know this. A church member told me, he, he actually told me more than he meant to tell me. We're doing this all the time. And on occasion, we hear it. This is where a faithful good and gentle spouse is such a blessing. And and we're good friends, faithful friends, you know, come up and say, you know, I'm hearing more anger in your voice. Or what you just said about that person, you know, that was inappropriate. You know, so, oh, I was just kidding. Were you? And those are, those are good conversations to have. Um, and so that's very helpful. And here scripture teaches us about, you know, that our, our words should be seasoned with grace. And, and it's a helpful barometer to us. It's helpful um, to know, I'm thinking one mutual friend of ours who was raised in a very difficult situation and came to Christ later, later in life and is still frustrated with words that come out of his mouth now and then. But what he doesn't see are the beautiful things that come out of his mouth and, and, and the things that he was never capable of saying that he says now. And, and that's encouraging, too, and it shows us the power of words. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk about this in spouses. In one portion of the book where my wife was a little uncomfortable, it's like, this is a little. I said, it's in the Bible, <laughs> so I can say it. Uh, where Solomon builds up his wife with words. But think of how our friends build us up with encouragement, where we were completely unaware of things. So the ambassador is very important. But I think the next chapter on the, the gatekeepers and the eyes and the ears is really, really helpful. And not because the chapter is helpful, but because where the Bible is helpful. Yeah, and, and where the Bible is giving us such um, appropriate for our day. Nothing could be more appropriate uh, for people who live in the most audiovisual age that's ever lived. I, I talk about this in the airport. I think I borrowed this uh, from uh, my friend Bruce, um, a pastor down in Joliet. Illinois, about you, you go into an airport, you sit in, in, at your gate, and people, you walk, look around, they got wires coming out of their, their ears. You feel like you're in the, the trauma ward at a hospital. Everybody's hooked up, and their eyes are fixed on a screen. Yeah. And so here, their eyes and ears are completely, completely you know, transfixed upon what's happening. And the Bible says, if you want to guard your heart, guard what comes into your eyes and your ears. And it's very, very helpful what Scripture says. And you just think about it. You know, what I choose to look at and what I choose to look away from and the things that I've heard, I didn't want to hear, but the things I choose to hear, that this is very, very formative for for where my heart will go. And it shows the importance of reading Scripture and listening to gracious talk. And it doesn't say, Scripture is not suggesting that we somehow leave culture. That's not the point. But where is your... Where is your finest company? Who are your counselors? Um, and and what, are you, what are you looking at and what are you listening to? And, and, and try to give some practical things there with a well, heart. Yeah, not to become too pointed, but this is, this is why Instagram's so popular. Mm-hmm. And in the, in the dead period, you're, you're waiting in line, you're whatever. You're in the restroom, whatever. People pull up, pull up Instagram and just flip through pictures of things they long for. Yep. You know, I've, mine's loaded up with guitars and hunting and fishing stuff <laughs> right but w- you do that if you fill up all your dead space in the day with whatever it directs your heart where's your heart it starts to become unbalanced or out right. of bounds 
And it's and it determines to a large degree what you meditate upon when you mm. don't have that ability. Yeah. What am I thinking about when I go to bed at night? Right. So it's it's helpful. It's very very helpful. I think just in the last chapter of the book, um, this is kind of a reminder. It's 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 almost a sermon. Uh, who's keeping whom? Yeah. And it, based on Psalm one twenty one, where the Lord six times reminds us He's the one who keeps us. Amen. Which is a great, great promise because, again, it comes back to God's grace and the sufficiency of his grace in the gospel that those times when I have just not done a good job keeping myself, which have been a thousand more times every day than I realized, that he was keeping me. And he was measuring and moderating, you know, everything that, that happens to me. Nothing truly happens to me. It's sent to me. Right. And, and just the right amount at the right time to make sure that I would not ultimately fall. Uh-huh. And that he would teach me through it, strengthen me through it, make me wiser, more humble, better in praying. Um, because he's the one who's who's keeping me. Right. He's the keeper of Israel. He's the keeper of his children. I think that's a good place to, to end on that note, but to bring it back to the, the threefold office of Christ. Of course, Christ is Lord of the heart, and, and we mean that he is prophet, priest, and king. But just... You know, for a moment, you know, for illustrative purposes, I love the our confessional language of uh, our catechetical language of Christ in His office of King. What does He do? He rules and defends us. You know, he conquers His and our enemies. And you know, Israel originally, what did they want? They wanted a king like the nations, and they got one. And He couldn't even deliver to them what they wanted, and they became His slaves. But even if they had a king that could do what they theoretically wanted in terms of defeating all their earthly enemies. That king could not defeat their heart and reign and rule over their heart. And that's what Christ does for us, you know? And that's one reason I really, uh, among many reasons, really appreciate this book. Um, The depths of it, but also the accessibility of it and the just the utter practicality of it. I mean, this is life. This is where the rubber meets the road. Right. And so thanks for writing it. Well, you're welcome, and you should... um Thank the people who enabled me to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bethel Church, Calvary heard this in various forums and some churches and Mm -hmm. Presbytery meetings. I'm very grateful for these people who have been helpful, you know, and, but, you know, especially to, I think when I read John Owen, um, we're reading an incredibly sophisticated theologian, but when you read Mortification of Sin and other things, you have a sense he understands, he really understands his own heart, and that's why he speaks so powerfully to us, and and throughout this, you know, just come to understand and see my heart more and more mm-hmm. and see how distrustful it is and to uh, see that the only sure footing is, is Christ. And and like you said, to see the sufficiency of his ministry, his active ministry in me on my behalf and brothers and sisters in Christ in this capacity is is the only sure hope. Everything else is a sinking sand, as we say, but... So hopefully um, people will find the book useful, but it will be most useful if it draws them to Christ, you know, and points to him and to his ministry, and not to put them confidence in themselves, Mm -hmm. to be glad for the treasures he's given to them for the sake of their own heart, Mm -hmm. but to run to him uh, more frequently and more earnestly. Um, So I, I trust the Lord will use it for that purpose. That would, that would be very satisfying. Yeah, right. To, to know that that's how it's being used, and we trust that it will be. Well, the book is With All Your Heart, Orienting Your Mind, Desires, and Will Toward Christ. It's published by Crossway 2020, written by our guest today, Tony Troxel. <laughs> <laughs> A. Craig Troxel, formerly Tony, uh, but uh, we know him as Dr. Craig, Reverend Dr. Craig Troxel, Professor of Practical <laughs> Theology here. I don't do that with other guests, but I'll do that's that fine. with you. That's fine. That's fine. It's good. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks Same so here, much. brother. Well, we encourage people to check out the seminary online at wscal.edu, uh, as well as Reform Forum at reformedforum.org. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you have any questions, comments, comments feedback, suggestions, of anything of the sort, email is a great way to do it, but you can head on over to our contact page, and it'll tell you all the ways that you can communicate with us. And I'll look forward to, if you haven't already, go and watch the interview with uh, Dr. Van Drunen and look forward to, Lord willing and barring any technological mishaps, uh, conversations, interviews with Brian Estelle and Steve Baugh as well. But thanks so much for watching and listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>